Hello, this is Professor Barker. I think we've met maybe once. And this is a lecture over Chapter 8, Body Mechanics and Patient Mobility. I would have loved to have been with your class to do this in person, but um, we had to go to the orthodontist today. So um, next best thing. In this lecture segment, I'm going to cover these objectives and um, state the principles of body mechanics, explain the rationale for use of appropriate body mechanics, discuss complications of immobility, and this is probably where the main focus of this chapter is going to be, and state nursing interventions used to prevent the complications of immobility, so these two objectives kind of are covered together, describe range of motion exercises and explain their purposes, and relate appropriate body mechanics to the techniques for turning, moving, and lifting the patient, which is what you will be practicing in your skills lab. This first lecture segment will kind of be an introduction, and then we'll get into some parts where you can follow along and highlight in your book. But before we get started, let's describe, um, define some terms here. Contractures. Preventing contractures is going to be something that you hear a lot about when we're talking about immobility. And when we're talking about a contracture, we're talking about permanent shortening of mus muscles resulting in limited range of motion. So even though a contracture occurs in the joint, it's more related to the muscle being tight and not allowing that joint to move. Gait. Um, those of you that have worked in healthcare are, are familiar with this term already, but we have some that in the, in the class that have never worked in healthcare before, and you might have never heard of this term, but G-A-I-T, so it's different than a gait to a, um, an, as an entryway to a field, but G-A-I-T is a manner of walking. And so when we ask, does somebody have a steady gait, that means when they walk, does it look like they're about to topple over at any second, or are they nice and steady and we don't have to worry about them falling? So a gait belt. This is a device that we place around the client's waist during transfers or ambulation to prevent falls. It is not considered a restraint, and really it just looks like a super ugly belt. Usually they're white with some stripes down them, and you probably, when you go into a clinical, you're going to see these in almost every patient's room, and no, they're not something that we use to punish people if they don't do what we tell them, give them a whooping with the belt, you know. The, but this is a great tool, and it's really fast. It takes 15, 20 seconds to put on the patient, and this gives us so much more control when someone's walking, and so this is useful if someone has an what we call an unsteady gait, meaning they can walk and they need to walk, but they kind of weeble wobble. And so by holding the gait belt and standing behind the patient, if they start to fall forward, we grab the belt. These belts are really strong and we can um, hold them so that they don't trip and fall forward very easily. If they start to fall backward, then we're behind them so we can catch them. And the side to side, um, we don't have quite as much control if they go side to side, but more so than we had like if we were just hanging on to their arm. Hanging on to someone's arm is just not a very good way to help help them ambulate because if they start to go down, you have this arm and, and that's it. They're, it. Unless they're super strong and can hang on to you, which if they're going down, they're, they're probably not capable of doing. Sometimes having hold of an arm does more harm than good because not only do they fall, but we just dislocated their shoulder and ripped it out of the socket as well. So gait belts are much better than trying to hang on to somebody's arm or, or underneath their arms even worse. And then uh, I always take for granted that students always know this, and I just got asked this question the other day by some students in my clinical group, what's an ADL? And that's a great question. If you've worked as a CNA, um, you know this term very, very well, but if you haven't, you have no idea what ADL stands for. So ADL, activity of daily living, we're just talking about things that we take for granted that we do every day, eating, dressing, bathing, brushing, brushing teeth and grooming, brushing hair, and um, but those things can be really challenging for someone who's say, has had a stroke or has other issues of Im related to immobility. Some more terms and acronyms that you might encounter. Activity tolerance is the amount of activity a person can perform. And so um, different people have different levels of activity tolerance. Sometimes it's not so much joint or muscle problems that create an activity tolerance, but it's the shortness of breath. So our COPD patients often have what we call activity intolerance, meaning that 
their muscles are strong enough to do stuff and they have their marbles so they can they know that they need to brush their teeth but they just get so short of breath that they have a, a lower tolerance for any type of activity mobility just refers to the ability to move about freely so anytime someone can't move about freely we say that they have immobility muscle tone is the normal state of balanced muscle tension and so this can alter due to disease so if someone has a stroke for instance they might be what we call flaccid on one side meaning they can't contract the muscles on that one side or sometimes we see the opposite of flaccidity which is rigidity and that can also accompany a stroke or spinal cord injury where someone's um, hand or arm is very very tense all the time and they can't relax it and we call that um, muscle rigidity both of those are alterations in muscle tone range of motion is often abbreviated ROM that is how much a joint can move in response to maximum extension from maximum flexion so a lot of times if someone has various types of arthritis they might have limited range of motion in their joint or if they have um, have a fracture I had a lady just last week in clinical and she um, fell and fractured her arm in numerous places and had to have um, surgery re surgical repair and so her right arm had a lot less range of motion than her left she could only bend her elbow about 30 degrees and she couldn't straighten it completely on her right side whereas her left side she could bend that elbow even beyond 90 degrees and completely straighten it so she had limited range of motion in that arm that she had previously fractured another term that comes into play a lot especially when we're talking about complications of immobility is friction and have you ever had a carpet burn ouch right um, those can occur real easily in our immobile patients when we're moving an immobilized client we're constantly trying to find ways to reduce friction so all of the things that I have listed here the draw sheet and um, this positioning of the client are all designed to reduce friction we want the least amount of pressure and surface area being slid across the bed as possible. So we use a draw sheet because it's going to be the sheet that slides over the undersheet rather than the patient's skin. Also a draw sheet allows us to um, pick up more of the patient rather than just where our hands would go. So if you just use your hands you're limited to the what six inches that your hands can cover to lift the patient off of the bed whereas with a draw sheet we can lift more of the patient and it also um, allows us to use more than one person so that makes it safer for um, the healthcare worker as well as much 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 better for the patient so draw sheets are great at reducing friction for the patient have client place arms across chest again to decrease the surface area so if their arms are across the chest that means they're not dragging across the bed doing this um, friction friction also makes it harder on the healthcare worker because it adds more weight and resistance to us pulling them up in the bed and then finally when you're pulling someone up in the bed and that's really where we see the most problems with friction have the client bend their knees and help again we're reducing the surface area by having some of their legs off of the bed and they can actually push with their legs to try to um, fight gravity and help you along. Other methods of foiling friction would be to use an air assisted device or a mechanical lift. A lot of the patients that we'll see are on what we call air mattresses and these can help. Mechanical lifts should be used anytime the patient is either uncooperative or incapable of cooperating like just a what we would call completely flaccid or paralyzed. If um, this isn't an option we can recruit plenty of help like I said with a draw sheet you can use up to four people one on each corner of the sheet to help move the patient and so the the weight is divided among four people instead of just one or two and finally the trapeze bar these are great tools when a patient's capable of helping you they have to have some upper body strength but um, if they do that is a helpful tool tool again the force exerted against the skin while the skin remains stationary and the bony structures move is called shear so this is just the physics definition so friction creates shear on the skin and shear on the skin is not good that can lead to um, 
abrasions and breakdown of the skin and skin tears and all sorts of bad things. So here's a picture of a trapeze bar and you can see normally it would take several people to help pull this patient up in the bed but here this nurse is able to pick her up kind of like a baby which he normally wouldn't be able to do this isn't a very bulky strong nurse but the patient's supporting most of her weight on this trapeze so really all the nurse is doing is kind of giving her booty a scoot right up and the patient's doing all of the work so trapeze bars are great but again see you can even see her muscles straining here so the patient has to have um, some upper arm strength in order to use a trapeze bar Here's a video on body mechanics. There are at least 6 million carers in Britain. It's a vital job and it's also one that many people think is easy, provided you apply a little bit of good old fashioned common sense. Some of the time that's true. The problem is all too often what seems like common sense isn't, making it all too easy for the carer to end up needing care themselves. This person needs to roll over in bed. The carer stands with feet side by side and their knees against the bed. And stooping forward, they then hold the person by the shoulders and hips and roll them towards the edge of the bed. It might seem the obvious way to do it, but the carer can't use legs for positioning and the top heavy posture with the arms extended risks putting strain on the lower back. As for the person, they're left teetering right on the edge of the bed. Moving the person up the bed can also cause problems if you get it wrong, like this. It's the same as before. Poor positioning, top heavy posture, pressure on the lower back. By trying to take the majority of the person's weight, the carer risks overbalancing. The person in bed can also suffer injury. The dragging can cause skin damage to the heels and buttocks. So is this better? No, if anything it's worse because in addition to all the risks we've mentioned, there's a danger of damaging the person's shoulder. Helping someone sit up seems like an easy task. And if you do it right, it is. But doing it this way, stooping and with the weight taken on one side, risks back injury to the carer and damage to the shoulder joint of the person. Helping the patient sit to the edge of the bed can cause the same sort of problems. The forward stoop, rotation of the spine, and attempting to lift a significant amount of the person's body weight all risk back injury and damage to the person's buttocks. The aim here is to help the person to their feet. There's no hard and fast rule about the right way to do this, but there are things to avoid. Trying to do it this way, at arm's length, risks back and neck injury. While this method risks injury to the carer and the person they're caring for. If the person being cared for is unsteady on their feet or prone to tripping up, then the danger is they will overbalance and pull their carer over with them. This method seems obvious, but it's wrong. The carer has a firm grasp of the person and holds tightly until they are sitting. But if it's not done carefully, both the carer and the person they're caring for could end up on the floor. If a person does fall to the ground and they are uninjured, it's only natural to help them up, but it's important not to do this in such a way that the carer is injured. Stooping over the person and then trying to lift their entire body weight risks significant damage to the back. And for the person being lifted, there's the danger that their weight will be too much and the carer will drop them. Everyone knows that carers do a vital job, and it's a job that can be made easier if you get the right advice. Learn the way to do it right, and you'll not only safeguard the health and well-being of the... So I kind of found this video to be frustrating because it shows you everything what not to do, and, and then it kind of leaves you thinking, okay, well, are we ever going to move the patient at all? And um, it doesn't give you the how-tos. But I will say that it does a good job of showing you all of the things things that can go wrong and it really makes you think about you know maybe I should be using a mechanical lift rather than myself if there's no way to do it properly and that's that's the point I'm trying to get across is sometimes there's not a good way to do someone um, to move somebody by hand and that's why we have mechanical lifts